everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Purpose and Profit Sisterhood. I'm your hostess with the mostest, Jeanette Anderson, and I'm here today with the one and only fabulous Melissa Smith. Welcome, Melissa. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Okay, go so as you know, everybody who if you listened before, what I'll do is introduce Melissa, then we'll find out the, you know, kind of behind the scenes juicy tidbits, and then we'll launch into her topic. Today, we're talking about uh, virtual assistants, how to hire them, what to do, what not to do. Really important topic, because this is something that a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with. So I'm really happy you're here and joining us. Um, so uh, like I said, I'll read you the official insight, and then we'll, we'll get the, the inside scoop. So Melissa Smith is the founder and CEO of the Association of Virtual Assistants and the PVA, a firm that matches clients with the right virtual assistants. She is also the best-selling author of two books, Hire the Right Virtual Assistant and Become a Successful Virtual Assistant. Additionally, Melissa also mentors for Remote How Academy, the first global online education and individual certification program. Drawing from her experience while working on five different continents, Melissa truly understands how to operate a successful virtual business. Love that. Melissa has been featured by ABC, NBC, CBS, Entrepreneur, Forbes, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, U.S. News and World Report. And most recently, Melissa was named Top Virtual Assistant Consultant of the Year, a top 10 most inspiring women in business 2022, one of the top 100 dynamic leaders, and a trailblazing female entrepreneur to watch in 2021. Wow, that's a lot of accolades and a lot of um, uh, notice. So congratulations on all of that, Melissa. That's awesome. Thanks. And, and welcome. And I'm curious, did you have your VAs help you to get uh, a lot of that organized and, and in place and manage all the media and manage the, the awards and all of that? Um, absolutely. What yeah. I, my tagline for my business is because you can't do it all yourself. And when people tell me like, oh my gosh, you do so much. You do, I'm like, I tell them I drink my own juice. Yes. You better believe that I am not doing all this by myself. That would never happen. Uh, I can't do it. I don't want to. Sounds terrible. Um, all of the things. <laughs> so oh, absolutely. That makes sense. Absolutely. That's a big part of why we need support and team. So tell me a little bit about um, uh, you and what we wouldn't guess from reading your website or hearing your bio. What's something that people would never guess if they looked at you? You know, even when I tell them, people don't believe me when I tell them that I had a fear of flying uh -huh. up until 2015. So for someone who now has over 30 stamps on my passport, traveled the world in 2017, they're like, what? That sounds crazy. Um, <laughs> but I literally had a fear of flying until 2015, and I struggled horribly with anxiety attacks um, up until about 2014. And so those anxiety attacks have made it so I did not put myself out there. I did not let anyone ever read what I wrote. I was like a closet writer. I was afraid to go anywhere new because wow. I was afraid about having an anxiety attack. And I would literally have anxiety about having anxiety. Oh, goodness. Okay. Well, that's a lot of progress in a fairly short time to go yeah. from being afraid of putting yourself out there to being a published author of two books, from not traveling to being on five different continents. So how did you, because this that's not what this is about, but now that right. you mentioned that, how did you overcome all of that? How did you learn how to break through that? It It's baby steps. It was absolute baby steps. And um, I heard this quote after the fact, but it totally rang true for me. And it was everything you want is on the other side of fear. Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, when I first started my business, I was doing a lot of events and I would fly in person to events and you're like, but you're afraid of flying. Well, I still had to pay the bills. Like I still had my own business. I still was like, oh, you, you have money to give me? I Okay, let's do it. Um, and so I would take Dramamine, but I would take less and less Dramamine. Mm -hmm. um, and then prior to that, I was only making two flights a year. I used to live in California. My mom was in Georgia. I'd make one flight there to see her, one flight back. And mm -hmm. so having those long span, longer flights, only doing it twice versus 
being on a plane, flying for an hour, flying for two hours and, and hopping off. And you just, it's baby steps. It's getting used to it. And then on the other side of it, it was okay. Well, I just don't like being in fear. I don't have any, like anxiety. Like I ha- I wanted something more than I wanted to be afraid of it. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to join a writing group. I joined a, a writing group and then I started doing a blog and sometimes it was anonymous. Sometimes it wasn't. Sometimes I just shared with, you know, family and friends, but it was really about taking these baby steps. And then once I got comfortable in that, I just started taking the leaps. That's but, awesome. That's, there's some great advice in all of that um, about how to break through limitations, fears, and challenges. Uh, one, break it down into small bite-sized pieces. Two, call in support. So you wanted to write and put more writing out there. So you joined a writer's group. Uh, three, have a compelling why. So yours, one of yours that I heard was, I'm in business. I got to make money. So you want to pay me. I got to go there. And yeah. so really having that strong why that compels you to overcome the fear. The fourth thing is that I really heard that you were personally committed to not letting things constrain you, not letting your fear stop you and that it wasn't okay. And so that was kind of a, a personal um, impetus that that pushed you through or, or called you through to the other side of that. And you just, um, you called in lots of support for that and did it um, over time with some compassion and that, like you said, baby steps. Those are some great tips for how to break through anxiety and limiting beliefs and fears and so forth. So that's awesome. Um, so a uh, little aside, not the topic we were going to talk about, but <laughs> valuable sharing. Thank you for that, Melissa. So tell us a little bit about why you care so much about this. Why are you in the work, that, doing the work that you're doing? Why do you care if people get support? Because I just don't know how someone can really thrive if they don't. So my, I grew up, my mom was an assistant. And for me, I always knew I wanted to be like her. Every time I went to the office, they would say, we, could, we can't run this place without your mom. Your mom is so great. Your mom does everything. And I just thought she had the most powerful job in the world. Mm-hmm. And so I just wanted to grow up and, and be like her. And then on the flip side of that, we actually live with my dad growing up. Um, I, my dad was single dad raising three kids and he hated his job mm-hmm. and it was so miserable, but he just didn't feel like he could um, quit. He, you know, he worked two and three jobs at sometimes to, su- to support us. And in our family, we also had to take on roles for him um, to help. And we, everyone had a job in our house. And I remembered how much he would say, you know, I want to be there. I got to work. If I, if I could change anything, I would be there. And I, we were like, of course we know that. Mm -hmm. Well, then fast forward to the real world when I'm an adult and I see all these people and I don't see them having the same financial challenges. I see them having time challenges Mm -hmm. and they would say, oh, if I only had more time, I could do this or I could do that. And I think, but you do have the same amount of time as other people. It's just about using it wisely. And and what if I could help you with that? Mm -hmm. And really being able to help that person do what it is they want to do. Maybe it's spend time with their kids. Maybe it's spend time not working. Maybe it's, you know, getting out before five, maybe it's running or exercising or writing a book, whatever it was to them. My challenge was always, there is enough time. Mm -hmm. It's not that we don't have enough time. Let's see what is taking your priorities out of whack. Mm -hmm. And then let's rearrange this so that life flows through you and your life doesn't flow through someone else's. Mm -hmm. Um, And for me, that was always super, super rewarding because I thought, man, if my dad had a job where, you know, someone could help him do that. I mean, he was always super thankful to me and my sister and my brother, um, and then just, just being that for, for other people, my husband, he was a small business owner. I worked with him and supported him and his business, um, and really saw like how to take that burden off of him. He knew how to do his job really well. He knew how to go out and do what he wanted to do, but gosh, did he hate the administrative side mm-hmm. of it? Mm-hmm. So when I got into the VA space, it wasn't this thing that I had a dream about being. VAs weren't a thing when I went to school. That's, I went to school to be a secretary that, back when that's what we were called. Mm-hmm. And so when I started my own business, also a thing I said I never wanted to do, I just ran into all these people who just didn't know what they didn't know. Mm-hmm. 
And I loved educating them on that and really helping them and determine, you know, well, yeah, there's a person out there like that. Yes, you can absolutely do this. Yes, it's, you're not crazy. You're not too needy. These are all really great things. Someone else would love doing this for you. And I got such joy out of that. In fact, I got so much joy that for the first year, I didn't even know I was offering a service. I was just making introductions for people. I didn't even charge for it. It took me a year because I was having so much fun before I thought, huh, you know, I wonder if someone would pay me to do this. So yeah. I tried it and they did. And that's what I do from now on. That's awesome. I love that. And I love that um, you kind of have the quintessential uh, why story of both sides of the equation, watching your mom make a difference for people and help them be organized and help and, and how much they loved and appreciated that gives you the passion for being the solution. And then seeing the, the price that you guys paid, not having your dad around and the price he paid not being able to be there for you really want gives you the other side of wanting to provide that solution to people who really need it. So that makes a lot of sense. You know, my, my definition of your why is what an intersection of what you're healing from the past and what you long for, for the future, for yourself and others. So yours is a very direct straight line between those two, um, you know, motivations from your past and what you do now. So that's awesome. Cause it's, it's, so in alignment with, with the problem that you want to solve in the world. I love that. Um, so tell us a little bit about now that you've been running this. So tell, how long have you been running your agency and you place VAs for people, right? Tell us a little bit. I about do. So it's not an agency, it's a matchmaking service. So not having an agency allows me to attract the best talent. Um, and I have a 98% successful match rate. But the benefit for the client of that is not only that do I attract the best talent to begin with, but most of my clients enjoy an extremely high retention rate. So my clients, many of them have been working with their VAs now for eight years. Some of them would be nine, but I didn't charge them. So they, they're not clients. <laughs> um, and that's because they're working with another business owner. And so when you have that and someone that's not subcontracted, like through an agency, the turnover is far, far less. Right. And so when clients come to me, they come to me at all different stages. Sometimes it's like, hey, I know I need a VA. I have no idea where to start. Other people come to me and they may have a job description already. They may have done this before. They may have done it and had a bad experience, but they know I can't let that bad experience stop me. I still know I need this. And from there, I match them to the right VA based on communication strategy and ideal client fit. So communication strategy for you, the client, and your manner, your medium, your tone, your verbiage has to be super simple to communicate with this person or else it's not going to work. Right. And the ideal client fit is for the VA. They should think like, wow, I get to work with Jeanette every day. Like this is doing, this is exactly the type of work I always wanted to do exactly for the type of client I always wanted to do it with. And yeah. based on those two pillars, that's where that 98% successful match rate comes in. And then the high retention rate. Wow. And for me, it's all about creating that win-win situation. If it's not a win for both parties, if it's not completely transparent, then it's not going to work. If someone's winning and someone's losing, then that's not for me. It's not for my clients because I like to say I don't work with losers. Yeah. So everyone has to be winning for it to work. And that is, that's what I love. Because it is challenging to think, where do I find this person? And I, that's what it was happening when I started my business. Here on one side, I had all this community of, of VAs that I was connected to. And they were all asking the same question. Where do I find clients? Where do I find clients? And then over here, I was meeting all these clients who I was, you know, this is nine years ago. So a lot of them, I was educating on virtual assistants and they didn't even know what it was or how it worked or, or anything like that. And they were like, well, that sounds great where do you find these people? You yeah. know, I thought, gosh, I know tons of people, but over and over again, I thought in my mind, how can two people who want to meet so badly, mm -hmm. not even know where to start. Right. And so being able well, to do that was really fun. I still cool. find Let's, let's talk a little bit about um, that process because it's changed quite a bit. Now, I think a lot of entrepreneurs know about Fiverr and Upworks and various other places to find them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're successful with that. I myself am actually going through a second round of interviews right now with people because the VA I found fell through and wasn't, didn't actually end up showing up despite going through interviews and testing and so forth and so on. Um, so 
it, it can be challenging. So let's talk about a couple of the things that you've learned over the years. What is one or two of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs make when it comes to hiring a VA? Uh, the latest one that entrepreneurs are making is they have the worst job descriptions, like the worst. I don't know who put it out there, but I know one influencer has to have done it, maybe more, but I know one influencer did it because I've seen the trends and I've been doing this too long not to notice the trends. Yeah. And one of the things that they're putting in these job descriptions are this shouldn't be about money for you. Mm. And if you ever want to just make everyone worth their salt, if you want to ever like just throw away the best in the business, put that. Yeah. Put, put that. It's I don't business. Why it should it be about money? That makes no sense. Whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous because yeah. they want their, the idea behind it is that this person should want to work as hard and have the same passion that you have in your business. Yeah. And that's impossible. Yes. It's absolutely impossible. It's also not fair. You, you want, not you want someone who sees your vision and gets it. Yeah. That's what everyone wants. So that's yeah. a huge mistake that I see. Beyond that, job descriptions are usually written in a very negative form. They're not exciting for the most part. So even if a client comes to me and they have a job description, I rewrite it. I have clients that come to me um, just to rewrite their job descriptions yeah. because when I write them, even though the client's anonymous, because right, I don't want the person wanting to work for them so they could be like them, right? I don't want someone who's like, oh my gosh, Jeanette, like I want to be like Jeanette one day. Like we don't want that. We want someone who's in love with the work. Mm -hmm. And so even though I write it with my clients being anonymous, they, when they read it, they're like, this is me over and over and over again. When you write a job description, the VA should think, wow, it's like, they're talking to me. Mm. Okay. The other side that I see, and this one happens all the time is not doing your due diligence. Right. And so that includes if this was referred, this VA was referred to you by your best friend, your colleague, your most trusted partner. Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean this person is going to do the same work in the same way and be just as successful with you. You still have to do your due diligence with this person. Find out how they're working together with you. Don't ask them questions about that particular client. Ask them questions that would pertain to working together with you. I see it over and over and over again. I still conduct reference checks. Everyone gets a background check these interviews that we go through, it's a, a lot less about testing. If mm -hmm. there's a right VA, it's not about testing. You could test someone to death. And I've seen that over and over and over again. They test them out and they're like, I don't want to work for this person <laughs> anymore because it's no different than if someone hired me and they come to me and they're like, oh, you were highly referred and you know, you got all this stuff. Can you show me all your stuff? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, I have books. I have workbooks. Great. Can you take a test for me? Yeah. No, I, I won't. Um, like I'm happy to send you referrals of my clients. You can read all this stuff, but, um, no, I don't, I don't do tests anymore at this stage. You're not hiring entry level. And so respecting that person where they are, you can do the due diligence. I, I tell people all the time, do it. Yeah. And that means interviewing more than one person. You mm -hmm. wouldn't interview one person if you had a company and were responsible to a board. This is your company, your board, maybe just you, but you need to interview more than one person for a job. Right. Absolutely. I had one of those situations where a close colleague referred the person that they used often. That person mm -hmm. ended up taking $500, delivering nothing and not doing the work and wasting two and a half months of my time when I could least afford it. It was so frustrating. He does work for her on an ongoing basis and, and apparently is wonderful, but was a nightmare for me. Um, mm -hmm. And I just simply hired him based on her recommendation without testing, without, or like when I say testing, I mean, trying a trial project or seeing if we work well together on some small job to mm -hmm. see how the communication is, that kind of thing. That's what I mean when I say that. Um, uh, so, and, and without even actually talking to him a lot in depth uh, and didn't do any checks. Uh, so by all means, even if they come referred, yes, you got to check them out. So what are some other mistakes besides job description and not actually um, checking enough, doing enough due diligence? What are some other mistakes that people make when hiring a VA? How about like- yeah, One VA is going to do it all. 
Oh yeah, I was gonna say, how about the unicorn um, design? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly like these unicorn BAs out there who can do a lot, who will do a lot, but what is the expectation then? Because they, someone who can do a lot, it doesn't mean they're going to be great at a lot. And so that's what happened to me when I was educating all these clients on virtual assistants and what we do and how we could help them. They'd always say, great, can I hire you? And I would say no. And they would look at me like I was crazy, but I would tell them, I'm just not that type of VA. And they're like, what does that mean? And I said, well, I'm not going to be able to to do it better than you're going to do it. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to do it to, in a way that's going to anticipate your needs which means you're going to be delegating to me, which means it's more work for you. Mm -hmm. And as much as you may want to delegate, okay, Mm -hmm. I don't like to be delegated (laughs) to. So that's not going to work for me. The measure of a true assistant is the ability to anticipate your needs. That's human or AI, the ability to anticipate your needs. So if you're hiring someone who cannot anticipate your needs and you're always delegating to them, That's a task taker, that's not an assistant. So Mm -hmm. I should know this so well, and this is how I like to work. I should know it so well that you just lead me in the direction, you tell me where you wanna go and I will get us there. Yes. And that's how how it should work. And so when, you know, people are thinking about these assistants, it's okay if you want someone to do a lot, but your expectation would be what's going to suffer because of that. Yep. Yeah. I can do a lot, but something something's not going to be done as great as something else. So set the right expectations. The root of all disappointments are unmet ex- expectations. So set those expectations from the beginning mm-hmm. and then determine, does this person meet my highest expectation? Yes. If not, then it's not a good, not a good fit. And just so many times people are trying to jumble things and, and mash things together. So you want the executive assistant, but you also want someone who's good at social media. Those two things do not go together. Mm-hmm. You can have an executive assistant who posts for you on social media, but don't tie their results to the measure of the engagement or analytics or conversion of those posts. Those things are not the same. Yes. Yeah. And, and so there's two really important pieces in the, what you just said. One is um, make sure that they're being measured on what their tasks are to accomplish. And most people are not good at all things. Like they can't be technical and creative and an executive assistant and a social media manager and an OBM and, and, and all of these different things um, because they just cannot be good at all of those things any more than we are. Um, so hire them for the role and the task that's the most important for them to do and make sure it's a good fit. But I really, really want to not step over the first thing you said, which is, uh, there's a big difference between hiring team that you delegate to and then have to manage and project manage and follow up on, which actually ends up putting more on your plate. This is what I did initially. And for two years, basically I worked harder because I had a team than I would have if I didn't, uh, because I was, and I wasn't getting substantially more results. Um, So it was actually putting more on my plate than it was taking off because I wasn't giving them ownership of a task and hiring the person who could take the ball and run with it. Mm -hmm. I was hiring task doers and Mm -hmm. that's not the same thing. And I wasn't being the kind of leader that was clear about uh, transferring ownership, setting them up for success, giving them their areas of accountability and then getting the hell out of the way um, and not micromanaging, being a resource if they need it, train them so that they could be successful, but not managing the task big difference between delegation and abdication and actually getting things off your plate. So what are some things that entrepreneurs need to shift in their thinking to be, to be ready to successfully employ a VA? What do they well, do? You have to be willing, you have to be willing to suck at things. Mm-hmm. And I, that people was like, what, what are you talking about? Like, why, why would I do that? Like, why would I put that kind of, you know, work in my business? And it's because if you're going to work at things that don't matter for your business, right? It does not matter if I work on technology, no one is going to hire me because I'm a tech person. Mm-hmm. That's not, so I am willing to suck. Like, I'm just not willing to not do it, but I'm willing to suck at technology 
for the purpose of being really good over here at what clients really hire me to do, what I get joy out of. That means that from the very beginning, I'm going to say, I'm never going to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to do that. It doesn't mean that I'm not willing to roll up my sleeves in other areas. It doesn't mean that I'm too good for anything, but I have placed my higher value on my business and what it calls me to do and be. And it has nothing to do with technology. And that means that just like anything else, just like paying taxes, hiring a technology VA in my business is a cost of doing business, mm -hmm. period. And so when you set those boundaries for yourself, maybe it's a boundary, maybe it's a goal. The first person I hired was a bookkeeper. I could not get that off my plate fast enough. Mm -hmm. For me, the last thing I wanted to do was go out and get a sale and get a client and do all this stuff and then have to like organize it and then pay bills. And like that stuff, it, the wind like was <laughs> let out of my sails. I'm like, I can't do both of these things. Yeah. I don't want to. Um, and so really thinking about that, you know, you have to get into that mindset. Too many business owners have so many line items for all their business and have no line items for the employees or the contractors or the services or the coaches that are required to run their business. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, it's no different than not putting in for taxes and not for putting in for your business supplies, not putting in for your travel expenses, whatever that looks like for your business. These are line items for your business. Right. And when you don't put them in, you are just, you're not even giving yourself a goal to work towards or for, if you think you're going to do it forever, yeah. like that's not, that's just not sustainable. So there's so many things we can talk about because it's such a big and important topic, but uh, one thing really quickly, how do people <coughs> decide who to hire first? Because there's so many things they want to delegate that they don't like doing. How do they decide how to be strategic about who to hire first? Hire for impact and ROI. So who's going to have the most impact most immediately and how and what kind of return on investment is that? So for me, hiring a bookkeeper first, it was going to have the greatest impact on my business because one, I didn't have to do it. Two, this is a person I can just hire monthly. This isn't a person I have to, you know, talk to every day or whatever. I just send over the receipts and, you know, do my thing. I have access to QuickBooks. We're done. And the ROI was now I don't have to switch all the time out of one thing into another thing. And I can keep on that momentum of more clients and more sales and more money coming in versus thinking about what's going out. I wasn't at that place at that time. And so for someone else, they may think, well, it's only like five hours a week or it's only like every now and then. So I don't really want to hire for that. That's the perfect person to start with. It's small. You can retain a VA for as little as 10 hours a month. That is nothing on your budget. And then for that, you get that impact, that energy, that return on investment. That's where you want to start. You don't want to start by having to pay someone these exorbitant amounts of money. That's a hit to your budget. That's a hit to your mindset to start with. And the idea that, you know, Productivity is the things that we do it is false. Productivity is the energy that we have and the energy in which we flow from one task to the next. And so it may not be something that's difficult. It may be something that you can do really well. But if it is something that zaps your energy, mm -hmm. every aspect of your business will be negatively, negatively impacted by it. And so you won't ever get a return on investment for that. And in fact, you're going to decrease the investment in yourself. I really love that definition of productivity. It's not about what we do. It's about the energy that flows from one task to another. That's brilliant. Um, just very quickly before we end, what are some questions people should ask of anybody that they're hiring that we often don't? What are some of the things that we don't usually think of to ask and should? What excites you about the possibility of working with me? What makes you uniquely qualified to do this work? Where do you see yourself three years from now? Okay. All those things should be very telling. <clears throat> Absolutely. And, and 
Um, are you a big advocate or fan of people, you know, obviously you're a matchmaker, that's where you're making money and you know the benefits of that. What would you tell people who are going to, you know, go to Fiverr or Upworks or try to find their first person from somewhere like that? Um, what would you say is really perhaps the best and smartest approach for people who are trying to save money and need support? What's a good starting point? A good starting point is something that you feel that you have the time and energy to teach someone else. Mm. So you can teach it as you go along. Don't, don't hold back from hiring because you're like, oh, now I need to create these videos and these SOPs and all these documents to show. Do it as you go along while you're actually doing it. Because if you pick a video of yourself actually doing it, you won't skip any steps. If you actually try to do it before you do that, the curse of knowledge will kick in and you'll actually leave out some small but tedious yet important parts of that role. So go ahead and do it as you go and just know that you're going to save money by maybe hiring someone else that you're going to teach to do it. You're not going to save time right now. Right mm -hmm. now you're saving money, not time. You will flip that. And that is your return on investment for the long term that will keep on paying dividends. That's when compound interest will kick in for you. So there's nothing wrong with that as long as you can be realistic with how you're going to do that. Remember, the more things that you give to someone to do, the more onboarding you'll have to do. So don't be afraid or intimidated to start small, knowing that it those baby steps will add up over time. And, and I know that this, <clears throat> I know the answer to this is to, it depends, but a lot of times people are, are not sure, should I hire technical support first, social media support and marketing support, uh, finance or bookkeeping support or a VA for general, all the stuff that, you know, I don't want to do. Do you have a recommendation for entrepreneurs that are working on growing their business of where to start in terms of that? And, and if it depends, what does it depend on? Really start with the energy zapping. The energy zapping is so, so crucial because any that, anything that zaps your energy like that, you're also more likely to procrastinate. And we're one person. We're not like left brain, right brain. We're going to do this and then we're going to do that. It permeates throughout your business. It th permeates throughout your personal life. So mm -hmm. this moment that you can really get things off, it's not what I should be doing. It's what you need to be doing for yourself. And so if you're like, you know what? It's okay. I don't particularly like that, but it doesn't zap my energy. But this thing over here that everyone says is really simple. I'm actually really good at it. I avoid it at all costs. That's that's the hire that you should do. Okay. If it's not a hire, then you have to ask yourself, if you wouldn't hire anyone else to do it, even for cheap, then why are you doing it for free? Right. Yes, that makes sense. Awesome. Okay, there's so many other pieces on this, but you have a you have an educational tool that you want to give to people to help them with uh, some of these questions and answers. So tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. My mission is just to make sure that anyone who wants to hire the right VA has the opportunity to do so, whether or not they hire me. So I have a complimentary hiring workbook that you can download. It's free. It'll walk you through my exact process. It'll take you through the questions to ask yourself. It'll take you through the exact consultation questions that I ask, questions to ask the VA. It'll take you through writing a job description, how to interview, questions to ask, how to review proposals and contracts. It is everything that I do is in there because I really want everyone to be successful in this process. Love that. That's very generous. And so where do they go to get that? So uh, you can go to my website and click on the hiring a VA, hire, hire the VA complimentary workbook. And then from there, you can um, download it and um, it's interactive. So you don't have to print it out if you don't want to, if that's your style, then out by all means. But if you don't want to print it out, it's absolutely interactive online as well. Awesome. Okay. And so tell people how they can get, find out more information about you and your website. Sure. So my website is thepva.com. You can email me at melissa at thepva.com. And I'm on LinkedIn. So you can find me there, Melissa Smith, the PVA. Awesome. Okay. And PVA stands for? The Personal Virtual Assistant. Personal Virtual Assistant, just so people can remember. Okay. Thepva.com. And then that uh, workbook is that slash complimentary dash hiring dash 
workbook, um, or you can find the link in the show notes and or in the chat under in the Facebook group. And speaking of the Facebook group, um, <clears throat> the Purpose and Profit Sisterhood, please go. And if you're looking for a VA, um, first of all, A, reach out to Melissa and talk to her about that. But also feel free to post in the group if you are a VA or you're looking for a VA or someone who provides services for entrepreneurs. Every Wednesday, we have What You Got Wednesday, where you can promote your services and products. So please do that. Um, and because there are probably people in the group who need you and need your support, especially if you're a VA or a technical resource or a graphic designer or any and all of those things that we all need all the time. Uh, and it is, it can be a very challenging process. I've been at this for a number of years and in terms of hiring team and working with managing people, frankly, I kind of suck at it. And so it really is something that if it's not your forte, get help with it because like all things, we're not necessarily good at everything. We need to know where they're not our strengths and call in support. Yes, it costs more, but ultimately I can tell you from personal experience, it will probably save you money in the long run and even the short run. Um, <clears throat> so reach out to an expert like Melissa to get help with finding the right person. You can waste a lot of time, money, and effort in having the wrong team members. I speak from personal experience and need to get t-shirts that say something to that effect. Save me from bad team members. Anyways, um, thank you so much for being here, Melissa. Thank you for being a stand for really supporting people in getting support. Um, I think this is one of the things that keeps especially women playing smaller games than we could or uh, are capable of playing because we don't call in enough support. So I love having people on and profiling people who are passionate about supporting and helping people call in support. Um, so any last words that you have for people, last piece of advice that you'd like to leave everyone with? Yeah, just believe in yourself that you, you can do this. Um, you, you need this help and someone needs you and you, you're limiting yourself if you limit what you can do and what you really want to do in your business. No matter what the job is, I tell you, there's someone else who is so excited to do it. <laughs> Let them bring that energy into your business and you can use your energy for the good of your company. Beautiful. Great advice. Thank you, everyone. Please go out, call in support this week so that you can be the difference that only you can be in the world. Bye for now. Bye.